Because if someone wants you as their partner while they run around getting lovers and they just want you to be their sidekick attachment figure, then I would want to coach you on raising your self-esteem and dignity to see whether that really works for you. Welcome everyone to the Mind Valley Podcast. My guest today is an extraordinary woman, Annie Lala. Annie has an honor science degree in biology and philosophy. Her studies include evolutionary psychology, integral theory, spiral dynamics, intergenerational family systems, and therapeutic sexuality. And that last word, therapeutic sexuality, is why she's with us today. I was having a conversation with Annie on how fathers should be talking to their children about sex. And I realized that I had a discomfort speaking about certain things to my son, who is going through puberty right now. He's about to turn 14 in a few weeks. But we've never discussed things that, according to Annie, a man and his son should discuss. Things such as, why, where do erections come from? Surprisingly, many boys have no idea. Mm -hmm. They get weirded out or scared by it. More on that in a bit. But it's not just talking to your children. It's the conversations we have about sex with our date, with our lover, with our friends. We suppress it. We vilify it. We see it as something dark and dangerous. And this is what we're going to be discussing. In Clotaire Rappel's book, The Culture Code, the author speaks about how different cultures have subconscious codes for different aspects of life. In America, the culture code for job is identity. The culture code for money is proof. Money is proof of your talent. Can you guess what is the culture code for sex in America? It's violence. Americans associate sex with violence. It's no surprise that in Texas, there's a debate right now on guns and dildos. There is a, there is a protest movement happening at a university campus on Texas where women are walking around with dildos strapped to their backpacks. The reason? This is in protest to a Texan law that says that carrying a dildo, exposing a dildo in public is illegal, but walking around with a gun is perfectly legal. And so Americans are having this weird relationship with sex, but it's not just the US. Europeans are a little bit better, but when you go to Asia, the Middle East, India, there is a suppression of discussion and acceptance of sex. And what we're going to be talking about today with Annie is how to lift the veil, how to have open, healthy conversations so we can approach sexuality with the respect and reverence and, and in a safe way, in a conscious way that it deserves. So Annie, welcome to Mind Valley. Thank you, Vision. Yeah, you mentioned having conversations with your lover or your children and how there's this shrouded mystery around it and discomfort and awkwardness. But way more upstream than any conversations with others is the conversation we're having in our own mind about our own sex and where we learned how to talk about sex to ourselves in our own mind, our beliefs, was the imprint, the unspoken, implicit imprint we got from our family of origin. If we're watching TV and our parents see a couple kissing, how did they react with the scene on the TV? If there's some sexy scene happening in a movie, what energy comes over your parents? What comments do they make? You were sitting in a soup of family of origin, beliefs and values and what's right and wrong, and your parents' discomfort with sexuality at large and their own relationship to their sexual story and body and each other is literally soaked up and absorbed into the children. So before you ever talk to your son, your son is watching how you react to sexiness in the world and in yourself. And they're modeling and imprinting, oh, my parents' relationship to sex and to each other is the right way because we just copy the culture from our family origin. So any awkwardness you have with your own sexuality is going straight into your kids. So the place to work is where do you show up in awkward confusion, shame, and insecurity around how you think about sex before you even talk about it? So where, where do we draw the line? Um, is it, let's, let's talk about R-rated movies, for example, okay? I'm not talking about pornography. I'm just talking about the average American R-rated movie. Mm -hmm. When, I'm, when um, I'm watching a movie and my kids are there and there's an R-rated scene, and this even happens in movies like Deadpool, which is a superhero movie, and my kids are big Deadpool fans. What do we do 
when the characters on screen start ripping off their clothes, not nude, but start ripping off their clothes and making out. Do we fast forward? Do we pause? Do we ask the kids to close their eyes? What would you do? It's way more upstream than that vision. The converse, first of all, they rate the movie so that you understand what kind of scenes of violence and sexuality are in it. And doing a little research as a parent on what's going on can help give you access to pre-frame and prime your children. If the first time they're seeing a makeout or a sex scene is in a Deadpool movie, then we're sitting on our laurels as parents. We're not really showing up to preemptively frame and um, create a, a place for that information to dock. So when that information comes into their brain, it already has to have a home that has tags and values and context. And if there is a sexually violent scene, I might fast forward if I'm not wanting my child to have first imprints. Um, and I would do some research before my daughter sees any movie, cartoon or otherwise. Eben and I, my husband, we research and read the level of violence, the, the content. It's just like we don't even give her a book without really grokking what's in there because you're literally mainlining straight into their subconscious. So a little more preemptive contextualizing, priming and research on the parents part can help. Most parents wait till culture and other things, not them, introduce sexuality to their child's mind. It's the, the parent's job to get there first. You get there first. My daughter's known about sperm and egg and sexuality since she was four. We had stuffed toys. That was a stuffed sperm and a stuffed egg stuffy. And she had a stuffed placenta. We taught her the whole thing. She can tell you the, the, the journey of the egg. And, I, and as they develop, you, you tune in developmentally to what they can track and you offer new information as they can handle while being attuned to what makes sense to them. You have to customize and attune it to their unfurling consciousness. Okay, I've completely failed as a parent. <laughs> no, no, no. There's always time. There's when, always time to um, recontextualize, but you just you just keep yeah. watching, right? You keep watching for. I don't want my kids to find out about sex from some seven year old kid in the, you know at school. I want to be the first there because I'm going to have a more intelligent framing and context for that information to come in and land. Yeah, I know. I learned it from a 13 year old kid. You at least want to learn from a 13 year old, not a seven year old. But so so this, this is getting really interesting. I, I want to hear we want to go more into um, um, sex talk with kids. Right. But let's talk about among adults. Yeah. Well, first of all, um, I want to start with anyone who has children, because literally your child's relationship to their own sexual urges are being um, influenced by how they notice a you you react to a kissing scene on a TV show. OK, that's going on. So what I'm doing is I'm making sure that whenever my daughter interacts with her own sexuality, and by the way, she's eight now, and she has discovered masturbation. She doesn't know what it is. But I, you know, I've told her it's masturbation, but when she first discovered it, she was just taking her legs, crossing them on the bed and kind of wiggling. So the crossed legs kind of put pressure up between right. her legs and she gets like a pleasurable feeling. As soon as I saw her, saw her doing that, I sanctioned it. I was like, how does it feel? Does it feel good? She's like, yeah, I get these really sparkly feelings. And I'm like, great. And I taught her to do it in her bedroom. I never shamed her. I made sure I was encouraging and supportive. If my husband walked um, past her room and she happened to have the door open, I was like, you just keep walking. You just, you just send everything is safe and okay energy because she's discovering her sexuality. And this is a very important initial condition where any tiny... Ooh, yeah, yeah, ooh, oh, what's that? Any of your facial, all of that influences, is this good or is this bad? And what I want to mainline to my daughter is your sexual exploration and a discovery and the feelings are good. And I want no shame. And then as they become stronger, I want to give her con context and consciousness about how to interact with others. But those initial conditions, if we have shame about our own masturbation, we're not going to be able to handle our daughter masturbating in their bed. We're going to have something to say about it and they'll feel it in our tone and our energy. So it starts upstream with talking to your partner about how consciously you want to imprint sexual energy in your children as they take it forward. Oh, that, that, that's, that is so refreshing to hear because I admit I've been confused about that. I've not known how to bring up that conversation with my kids. I felt awkward about it. Yeah, you know, so awkwardness usually indicates lack of tools Mm -hmm. lack of um, tools, conversational tools, and internal emotional dissonance, or what I call a double bind. OK, 
Okay. So part of you wants to talk about your son, be all intimate and connected and explain things. Part of you is like, I don't even know what to say. No one taught me. You have no reference experience of anyone sitting you down when you were young, being calm and asking, do you have questions and saying, did you know that your penis might suddenly in the morning be like standing up and like hard and what that means with a congruent, loving teacher stance, right? The way you teach math. So that's interesting. Okay. Let's talk about, let's talk about talking to boys. Annie, I think I can't remember if, if it was you or your sister, Rhea who told me about that conversation on morning wood with, um, with her son. Her... Yeah. So my do- my sister has a boy and she gave him some context. Hey, you know, sometimes in the morning you might wake up and you have an erection. Well, she said your penis will be hard and standing up and that's totally normal. Daddy has it. All men have it. And it starts to happen when you go through puberty and it's totally normal. And sometimes you might want to touch it and, you know, it has an ejaculation. And she just described the whole thing. And he was like, oh, mom, thank you for telling me I was there. You know, I these things are happening. And and so she, you know, she caught it a little bit late. Right. So you want to it would be great if you set the expectation in your son earlier. So they're like, oh, it might happen someday. Oh, mom told me about this. Hey, mom, guess what? It happened. Now you have open dialogue and conversation. People think it's weird to talk to your children about sex or masturbation. Where? Why? I don't even understand why unless you don't have a demoed reference experience in your memory of it being talked with you. So then you think, well, you're not supposed to because my parents didn't. And we got to break that lineage wound of whatever my parents did. I'm going to just copy because I turned out okay. You're not trying to get your kids to turn out okay. You're trying to get your kids to turn out the most extraordinary, creatively expressed humans that could possibly be. And you want to upgrade the schematas that you're getting downloaded from your family of origin. And it has to be us. I mean, it shows how distorted our our society can be because right now my son learns everything on YouTube, but he can't learn this because this topic is banned on YouTube. And even if he could, do you want, do you want someone who's not customizing it and titrating it to exactly where they are at? Like you're going to be, you know, your kids better than any teacher. You can answer their questions and handle their current confusion. And, oh, this happened yesterday. It's just you want the customized, custom crafted articulation and your own personal experience. There's nothing more powerful than your kids hearing, you know, here's what happened to me when I was young. Here's what I learned. Here's what I did. And you give them a chance to feel included and belonged by having a sexual experience or an erection rather than ostracized and weird because nobody talks about this. So this must be weird. So so I remember when my son was four and he asked me, Dad, what is a vagina? And so I tried to be, I tried to be the cool dad. So I took up the iPad and I said, all right, well, we're going to put it in Google and I'm going to show you what a vagina is. That was a mistake. Don't Google vagina and show the picture to your kid. <laughs> you can't control the image downloads. But you're right. We got to do this ourselves. Not, not true, not true the internet. So I want to put you in this, I want to put you in this situation. Um, I was driving with my son. And uh, he must have been maybe six or seven. And the song Anaconda came on. And the lyrics were, my anaconda don't want none unless you've got buns, hun. And my son asked me, dad, why doesn't that anaconda want to eat bread? (laughs) What would you do in that situation? How old is he? Just go with that. Like say, you know, son, maybe the anaconda is vegan. I hear that's really hip among. How old was he? Seven. Anacondas. He was six. Or, six. or would you explain? Would you explain the lyrics of the song and what? Yeah. So at six, I think I would just go with, you know, he's vegan, vegan or he anaconda. doesn't eat bread. Because it depends. If you had already set up a conversation about sexuality, um, you know, then you can use social idiom. I let's see. This, this call, by the way, I mean, it, is, it, is making me feel like a real failure as a parent. Oh, no, Vishen, <laughs> listen, there's so much more about sexuality that your son is ready to learn and going right. to learn. And there's you're never out of time to start building uh, mutual shared reality around any topic. Just don't give up. Parents give up. They try. I see some questions there. I try talking to my son. They don't want to. I have this theory that when you ask someone a question or you open a conversational topic, they are checking to see whether you're really serious mm. so that you'll ask and they'll go, no, I want to talk about it, but it's really a test. 
They're seeing if you're going to come back three times. Three times is the magic number. You come back in another way, in another angle, and you try again. And you're passing the test each time. The test is the child or the other person is going, are they really interested? Are they really? Let me see if they'll get past all three guards. Because perseverance and tenacity means you're committed. You're interested. You really care. And that's something I want parents to know. Don't drop off at the first no. That's You're the leader. Okay? If some information is important for your child to learn and grow, you don't give up. You keep going. You find new creative ways. The onus is on the communicator to have information land. And you have to find what their map is, find a way into their map that feels safe for them, and then walk them through a new possibility. But it's your job to find a way in, not their job to show up. It's a very revealing conversation. I I like the direction you're taking with this. And I think everyone listening right now is beginning to see that these are awkward conversations uh, only because we label them as awkward. But these are conversations that we should be having with our children. Now, let's take this in a different direction. What about sex conversations among lovers? What do you see there? Where, Where do you feel we as a society might be a little bit too repressed in terms of how we talk about sex amongst adults. First of all, um, sex between lovers, it's usually not talked at all. It's usually moved into. Two people could meet one night, date for a week, and then have sex and never mention it at all. Right. And I'm not saying that's a problem because there's many ways to communicate. There's energetic there's subverbal, there's body language, there's emotional, facial. So as long as you're attuned and checking in, the, the trick to sex conversation about sex is, now let me see how to put this. If you have a desire or a worry or an anxiety, if there's anything you want, you're optimizing for or against around sexuality, it is your job to raise it and bring it into the conversation. Whether it's, I'd like to wear a condom. Have you been tested? Um, I'm not ready. If there's a thought going through your mind, a worry, a scare, an insecurity, or a desire, a want, all of those, they're in the black box of your mind. Nobody can read them. Whether you're in a committed marriage for 20 years and you like it this way instead of that way, or you're on a first date and he wants to have sex without a condom and you don't, it doesn't matter. If it's in your mind haunting your attention in any way, you speak that. Now, if you don't know how to speak that, then the tools I would offer you is to get that emotions are coming up. The reason you can't speak something ever is not because you don't know how to say the words. It's because feelings are coming in your body. And you're like, I don't know what to do with those feelings. In fact, I don't want to feel those feelings. So forget the words. To get to the words, I have to feel the feelings. So the trick is, and this is what I teach all my clients, my entire job is about helping people notice that they're having feelings in their body, physical sensations of feelings, not stories about feelings, physical sensations of feelings of awkwardness, tension in your shoulders, pit in your stomach, tightness in your throat, tuning into those feelings, hanging out with them for a minute breathing and digesting them, noticing that you don't die, that you might just have a little tense sensations coming through you. And then once those feelings have been tolerated, coped with and digested, you will be able to access the words. It's the fear of the feelings, not what are the words that are causing the awkwardness. Awkwardness means I got feelings in my body and I don't know what to do with them. So the way to transcend awkwardness is to actually start to tune into your body not your stories in your mind. Oh, I love that. I'm reading the comments emerging right now. And uh, Heather Robbins is saying, oh, so good. Megan P is saying, we need way more Annie. She is so refreshing. I just love the way she approaches this topic. So thank you, Annie. This is really fascinating. Now, I want to open up uh, the Q&A to, uh, to those of you who are here live with us, to all the Mind Valley members who are live. So click in the Q&A box and go ahead and type in your questions and you can vote up You can vote up questions that um, you like, and we'll be bringing up the top people to ask their questions to Annie. Bianca, you just came live. Do you have a question from a woman's perspective? Yes, yes. I was just thinking, guys, because you got on a weirder side, let's say. I was uh, was curious on on this topic. What do you guys think about ethical non-monogamy? And does cheating really exist in this case? So, monogamy. First of all, every couple that comes together 
reinvents what love is from scratch. Okay. There are common features that I can spot and go, these couples tend to seem to be more actually in love. These couples are playing some live together game, fake thing. And there's always gradations of love, but because you reinvent love from scratch, just like um, Vishen, you have a son, other people have a son, but, and they're all sons, but they're reinventing a human from scratch. It's a brand new son. And your son's not necessarily the same as my sister's son, just because they're called son. So you reinvent love from scratch when you come together with a new human, you re reinvent sex from scratch, just like your child is a new thing. So you have to bring these two people and you have to, for a relationship to have a powerful sexual experience together or elsewhere, you have to find your fuck with each other, invent it, learn, create, collaborate, share values, create, um, consciously create a sexual dance that works for both of you. That takes intentionality, consciousness, a willingness to have the conversations. So this is all precursor to if you're inventing love and sex from scratch when you come together with a new person. It's nobody's business how and how you what you do there. However, the one caveat I've I've found as a relationship coach is if you want this relationship to last, if you're in a committed long term partnership and you're not like fly by night, I want to have a harem, blah blah blah. If you actually want a primary partnership, the only time you want to bring in anything else, dildo, porn, another woman, another man, anytime you bring in anything else. The question you have to ask is and watch for, is this reinforcing the dignity, the self-esteem and the connection of the primary partnership? And if it's not dildo or another lover, you get that shit out of there because I'm a, I'm a strong, fair stand for powerful evolutionary couples in love that are creating magic in the world with their two geniuses working tandemly like two wings on one bird. I'm a, I'm a stand for power couples where the power is equally distributed in the feminine, the masculine polarities, and they work in tandem, not one partner has an accoutrement sidekick partner that doesn't really have any power. So if you want a real evolutionary dyad, you have to collaborate on love, on sex and monogamy. I mean, I don't have a moral stance on polyamory or monogamy. I think all of them are possible. But very, very, almost none and maybe none, almost no circumstances I've seen polyamory do I see both partners being radically transparently honest about the impact on their esteem, their dignity, and the feeling of cemented love that it's creating in the relationship. Most of the time, one partner is pushing and leading and slightly coercing like, like this. Well, I only want to be in an open. If you don't want to be with me, then you won't be. And I don't want, uh, then we're not going to work. What that is saying is I want to be with other people more than I want a relationship with you. And if you're in that situation, I want you to call your partner out on it and be, get very clear. Because if someone wants you as their partner while they run around getting lovers and they just want you to be their sidekick attachment figure, then I would want to coach you on raising your self-esteem and dignity to see whether that really works for you. Does that work for you even when you remember you're a goddamn goddess? Does it work even when you remember that you are the most magnificent creature he could ever meet or she could ever meet? And that's what I want partners. I want partners to look into each other's eyes and go, oh, I remembered I am God. I am part of God. I am a miracle. And if you're not getting that with your partner, I'm a fair stand that we find a way for you to get it either with this person and me, you and your technology, or you finding someone where you can find it. That's why I'm a fair stand for true love. I'm not just a relationship coach. I am the avatar for true love for the species. And I want that and nothing less in every relationship. And I will, I have a dream that every child is born from a couple who, when they look into each other's eyes, they go, I love you forever. And then the child feels that every cell in their body has two pieces of DNA that go, I love you forever. I love you forever. I love you forever. Who could we be if our parents were that? And so that's what I'm standing for with my work and end of rant. <laughs> that's beautiful, Annie. I love, love, love that, that response. Bianca, what was the second part of your question? There were, there were two questions that you asked. Uh, no, I was I was asking about ethical uh, non-monogamy and uh, if cheating really exists, actually, if so we think from this perspective. Well, cheating means traditionally having a sexual li liaison without telling your partner. And from all the polyamory situations I've ever looked at, it never works if you hide it, for sure. And 
by even being transparent about it, it makes so much work. Very few couples can handle the processing time. It increases the amount of stuff you have to work through exponentially. And um, if you want my, and it's just my personal opinion, in my research of watching couples do polyamory, most of the time, I'm not saying necessarily all the time, but most of the time, the person trying to pursue the polyamory is trying to avoid doing the hard work of finding their magnificence in their own sexual connection with their partner, because it's hard to do when all the attachment wounds come in. Once the attachment wounds and you fall in love, the stakes are so high. The terror is so big at being vulnerable and naked in the sexual connection that it's much easier to do it with strangers. It's much easier, but it's avoiding the hard work of finding your sexual connection with one person. So that's why I'm asking if your sexual dalliances reinforce the primary. Great. Now you said cheating. I heard that Nicole today once said, um, and I like this phrase, um, intimacy starts eroding with your first withhold. Any withhold. Ow, that hurts. I don't want you to do that. No, I don't want to go to the party, but I go to the party. Anytime you withhold a piece of truth, you have eroded intimacy in the dynamic. And I'm not, it's not about cheating or not cheating. I'm about making sure the maximal intimacy per interaction is optimized for. Intimacy being how far into you I can see and how far, how much I let you impact me so that I change. So Vishen, if we have a conversation and I don't get changed by it, I haven't been intimate with you. If you don't get changed by me, intimacy is about influencing each other not just showing who I am, having you impact. And so I would say cheating exists, but it's every withhold. I want to take it down to every time you don't share a piece of truth that is relevant and non-shaming, blaming, and make wrong. That's not what I'm talking about. Transparency, I feel, and this is what's going on, is how you breed intimacy. And I think in some way you're cheating on the us relationship entity every time you have a withhold. I love that concept. Intimacy is reduced from your first withhold. So I want to ask a question here. This is coming from uh, Shaknuza. So Shaknuza posted this in our chat and she said, how do you ask your husband to have sex when he doesn't want it, when he has lost the desire for it and has problems with getting an erection? Well, you have to be very patient and you have to be on a reconnaissance mission through your behavior, scoping out what opens and relaxes and makes safe their heart. Most people think that a seduction is, hey, baby, you want to do it? Hey, honey, I'm ready. I'm in lingerie. Seduction is about getting into the other person's reality and making it feel so safe, so smooth, so intuitive that they naturally walk to towards you. Okay. Um, curling. I'm Canadian. So we have hockey and we have curling ice sports. There's pucks on the ice in hockey. The, huck, the, the puck is pushed or pulled by the stick. Okay. Most people treat influence pushing or pulling another person, but curling a puck is issued onto the ice. And the way that the team moves the puck on the ice is they never touch the puck. They use these brooms and they sweep the ice in front of the puck. And the puck is just moseying on down the ice to the puck. It's feeling like it's meandering in its own direction. Meanwhile, someone's going like this in front of it. This is how you seduce someone. You seduce by creating a vacuum that allows them to want to move towards you. Now, what do you have to do and who do you have to be to make your husband feel safe enough and open and relax and heart possibility connected and sexually open? That is the inquiry. That's what it means to love this man. If you want to love this man, you've got to get into their map. And the first thing a person needs to feel safe is safe, and then they can be sexy. You can never be sexy until you're safe. So anyone who has a partner who doesn't want to have sex, there is, there's usually two reasons. One is they don't feel safe, and there's something both of you could do about that. And two is they're withholding sex as a power move. Okay? I, I was telling Vishen earlier, everything in life is about sex. Everything is about sex and mate signaling, except sex, which is about power. And most sexual dynamics is where all the relationships, antagonistic conflict di dilemmas come out. And so I work with couples on how they use power unconsciously and wield it during their sexual dynamic and by withholding sex. Beautiful. Thank you for that question. The next question we have is from Ryan. Ryan, Ryan has basically a, um, a, a two-part question. 
why is religion against sex? And can you explain pornography? Is it ultimately good or bad for men and women? Well, most religions want a group of people to work together and have shared values. And that's a very big ask. It's very hard to do. How do you, how do you, you just like herding cats, how do you herd humans to all, you know, participate in certain rituals and practice certain values? You have to have some sort of common theme that unites them. And so oftentimes sexuality is um, spoke about and handled in particular re religion contexts as laden with shame. Why? Shame is a way of controlling group dynamics, okay? If you're in a group of 10 people and there's only 10 pieces of food and you eat two pieces, someone's going to starve. So shame started in our tribal dynamics where it was a way of policing to make sure nobody did anything outside of what's appropriate for the whole group. So you'd feel shame if you ate two pieces of food, you'd be kicked out to the savannah and left to die. So you don't eat two pieces of food, you only eat one. It's a way of policing. Then you fast forward to now, we now use shame to police our children, to police our friends. It's a way of withholding love and making the other person feel a little bit scared because you don't feel love for them anymore. And it marks them. However, there's a cost when you shame. When you shame anyone, it doesn't just keep them doing the thing you want. It also reduces their self-esteem. It reduces your self-esteem and it reduces the trust in the relational system is a very, very high cost, except the cost is invisible. And most of us don't track the cost of shaming another person in order to get them to do what we want. So religion's using unconsciously the shame so that it can repress the force that is most likely to be in competition with its agenda. And I'm talking about, you know, fundamentalist religions that may want to curb certain behaviors. And I think it was beautiful and intelligent for the times that we lived in. I think the religions that use these technology was able to create civilized society. So it has a utility and an intelligence and a dignity. And in current day, I don't know if we still need that level of shame to police it. I think it's now doing more damage than benefit because now people are ashamed just to touch themselves alone in their bedroom because it feels good and, and learn about their own sexuality. And so um, that's why I suspect religions tend to point a kind of dark spotlight on sexuality, because how do you control a bunch of kids who want to have sex all the time? It's, right. it's a lot of energy. And then porn, um, I don't have anything as good or bad. I don't have those dichotomies. In certain contexts, something can be good or bad. It's really depending on the context. And the defining heuristic to figure out whether porn or anything is good or bad is to ask, is this behavior being um, acted out of compulsion and unconsciousness and habit, or it is, is it consciously taken and used with ritual and skill and intelligence? It's that difference. Unconscious compulsion usually takes you into the dark space. Conscious ritual, you can use anything in conscious ritual and upgrade everybody's self-esteem and dignity. So it's about conscious versus unconscious around porn. How can someone who has a big a big connection with their religion. And, and I'm talking here about every major world religion, someone yeah. who's deeply faithful for their religion, still, while understanding what you said about how religion suppresses sexuality, how can one be loyal to their religion, but still explore their sexuality and not suppress? I, so everybody, if you have a, really, a strong sacred connection to your deity, to your God, I think all religions encourage a personal connection to pray, right? To pray is to make a personal connection to your God. And all gods of all major religions seem to be loving, benevolent, caring, wanting the best for the world. There is no gods that are like, you're bad, you know, we want you to suffer. <laughs> There's no gods that do that. So then in your personal prayer connection to God, I would have you commune with the divine, literally in your prayers that you create your relationship to God. Think about the kind of God that is worthy of praying and being devoted to. Think of that God in your heart and then commune with that God and ask that God, not your priests or your parents or all these other people who are speaking on behalf of God. Talk straight to God. Talk straight to God with your heart and ask God, what do you think? 
and try to get all the voices of what everyone else has told you out of your head. And imagine what a benevolent, loving, caring, wanting the best for you God would say. And that's what I would ask you to do is to listen to your direct connection through your heart, not through your head and ignore everyone else's voices because God wants you to listen to it, not these second rate, you know, intermediaries. I love that. Thank you for, thank you for addressing that. Now let, let, let's go for a question in a different angle. Let's talk about sex and dating. What, there seems to be so much confusion here and so much, so many different pieces of advice that one can listen to. Is it okay to have sex with someone in the first date or does that make you a slut? Is it okay to, to um, have sex with a friend and then go back to being a friend? Is, should we be going through a particular time period or interview process before we sleep with someone? What are the rules for sex and dating? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and again, I don't have simple heuristics or rules, but I do have precepts or frames. So that last question you asked, you know, when do you have sex? When's the right amount of time? It's very, very personal. But here's what I want you to track. Here's what I'd want everyone to have. Never do anything, anything physical or sexual that you don't feel is congruently aligned with your safety, your self-esteem, and your dignity. And you need to learn to check because there's a lot of people telling you, well, just do this, just do that. Why don't you just do this? Oh, come on, just this. And if you don't have a strong internal sense that you've been practicing your whole life of checking with your intuition, and intuition is a very inquit kind of sense. I think of intuition, the way I describe intuition is it's your future successful self leaning back in time and whispering to you what to do next. So always checking in with your intuition, which is basically in your body, not your head, so your heart. And you just take the idea or the thing someone's telling you to do and you run it through your heart and your heart either contracts or expands. It's digital. It doesn't have any story. It's just yes, no. And anytime you get a no, whether it's what tea to drink, what food to have, whether I should have sex with this person, should I go to the party? Should I marry the person? Any question you're asking, you run it through your heart, yes or no. And you, it's sometimes it's just a tiny contraction. But all you need to know is it contracting or expanding. If it expands, do it. If it contracts, don't. And look for something that expands. So that's the first thing is to tune into your body. Use your body as an instrument rather than your thoughts or your shoulds or what people will think of you. And that takes courage. And so that's something you have to develop. And you know, in my coaching, I teach people how to develop that courage and use their instrument. But in terms of how long to wait and all that, it's, it's honestly how long you wait as long as you need to, to feel triumphant in the next move. Because sometimes, okay, I really like him cuddling me, but I don't quite want to kiss him yet, but he's leaning over to kiss. Right. So what do you do then? You stroke his face and you say, I love that we're connecting and I'm not ready. As he moves in for the kiss, you just put your hand on his cheek and hold him there like this. There's always a way to lovingly say yes to you and no to the next move. I'm a yes to you, but I'm a no to go into your party or painting your house on Saturday, but I'm a yes to you. So you have to ramp up the love when you have to hold a boundary, more love than boundary. They'll hear the boundary. If it's just boundary with an F you, they can't hear it because they don't trust it because you don't trust people whose hearts are closed. I love inherently dating dating brings up so many insecurities in people. And sometimes setting a boundary can somehow make someone feel like you're no longer interested or that they have failed. But I love the way you explained it. Yes to you, but no to this next step right now. Yes. When guys would come up to me at clubs and they'd want to do something or, you know, and my boyfriend's just across the room, I would grab their hand because in my mind, this is like someone's son. And they took all the gumption and nerve to walk across that club and say hello to me and chat me up. So I'd grab their hand in mine like this. And I would say, thank you so much for noticing me. I feel beautiful. And I'm with my boyfriend or I can't, I'm with my girlfriends and I want to wish you the best tonight. It's, I love you. I'm clapping for you. Your mom would be proud of how I'm treating you. And I'm a no. More love love than grumble. I love that. I I mean, I, I can tell you from a male perspective how devastating it can be when you're a young boy and you get shot down for the first time when you approach a girl, right? And and young young teenage boys take it as a, blo- a massive blow to their self-esteem and identity. I've gone through that when I was in college and it's really painful. So I love your advice to women on how to handle that. That's so beautiful, Annie. 
Yeah. I, I think every woman holding a boundary with a man has to remember there's a human heart on the other side. And how can they honor their human heart and say, no, it's a, they honor those. Ba- no guy ever bothers me after I do that. Right. When I look them in the eye and just love on them with my no, they're gone and their dignity is intact. And I'll wave at them on the way out and everything's good. Beautiful. So let's go on to a couple of other questions which are coming in from, um, from the audience. So the, the leading question has to do with sexual repression. The person asked that I do not mention her name, but she says, I've been sexually repressed by my parents and I'm now being repressed by my partner. Can dialogue reduce this repression? How do I change? Yeah, this is an ancient one that we got to take, take, you know, dismantle. So first of all, the frame that I'm being repressed by someone else, though it makes a lot of sense and it can feel that way, what happens is the parent comes in and says, don't do the sexual thing. And then you photocopy that and go, okay, hey, Annie, don't do the sexual thing. They give it to you, but you had to take it. Because there are some people where parents did that and somehow they didn't, or they they had a, a grandma or someone else giving them permission. So get that it's an inside job, the repression. And I know it doesn't feel like that, but once you realize at some level, they're not around, they're not in the house, no one's, te- no one's, you know, there's no, usually the repression is you going no to your own desires. So once you realize that, then you have a little more power because if someone else is repressing you, well, you're stuck, especially, you know, if they have some kind of gun to your head or they tied you up. But if it's an inside job, then what, what I'd recommend in that moment is literally imagine that your parents' expectations, values, beliefs, and all that are in your space squatting like people living in your basement that aren't supposed to be there. And your job is to go, oh, that, that's not mine. And then to tune into your core and kind of find your center and then let all that float out of your head, that repression, sex is bad, sex is wrong. Let it float back to your parents or the religion or the culture, wherever it came from. It's fine that they have those views, but those aren't even your views. The fact that you call it repressed lets me know that it's not your thing. So you have other people's expectations and thoughts and energies and feelings in your space. You can't digest those feelings. You can't do anything with other people's expectations. Let them have them back to finish their karmic journey. I literally close my eyes, find my center, and I let all the things that are not my beliefs and thoughts and values float out of me and find their way back to where they need to go. I don't need to know where they go. They just I give them permission to leave. And then I come back to myself and then I go, well, in the, in the clearing now, what do I want? Do I want to just touch myself and see how it feels? For this person, I would say, if you want to transcend your repression, do this clearing where you let you meditate every day and let any thoughts and judgments and shames and guilts that are not yours. And the way you'll know they're not yours is they contract you. Okay. If a feeling comes up in your body and it's natively made by your nervous system, endogenous, you won't be contracted. You'll know how to process it. If it's someone else's feeling, expectation, shame, guilt, you'll feel overwhelmed, contracted, triggered, can't cope. Can't cope means other people shits in your space. So after you clean that out, then I would start to um, lie in your bed with your body and just touch your body. Just touch your body and notice how it feels to just send love and touch to your body. Forget genitalia or any of your erotic zones first. Just, just feel your own touch and the, the beautiful delicacy of it. And that, that will, and just feel how inherently yummy and good stroking your own arm is. And then ask your personal God, is this okay? That feeling of love and pleasure? And you'll get a resounding yes. And then you start piecemeal with just everyday pleasure. Sexual pleasure the way you treat sexual pleasure is an increased exponential version of how you treat everyday pleasure. So the trick is to become good with hot tea in your mouth, the smell of your mango shampoo, the feeling on your teeth after you brush it. Those everyday pleasures is how you wean yourself back onto feeling sensuality, which is the beginning of sex. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful. And now we come to the final question. So firstly, this has been such an in, in, intriguing conversation. Um, I, I love that you're lifting the lid on so many topics that people consider taboo. The final question is this, what are your views on um, spirituality and sex? We're talking Tantra um, and other, other so-called spiritual sexual practices. I think bringing consciousness to your sex is the ultimate spiritual practice. 
to, in me, in my opinion, that's, that's as good as it gets for a crucible for self-actualization and growth. I would take that any day over meditating alone in a cave by myself with no, nothing, no people to mess up my, my enlightenment. <laughs> True enlightenment, in my opinion, is being able to find your connection to your aliveness and your pleasure in the presence of another human being, because that's the hardest shit there is. So if you want, <laughs> you know, the rigors of a religious discipline, take on tuning into your pleasure and becoming a, a researcher of that and tuning into being transparent with your partner about what you love, what works and what doesn't. And this, you know, when you have a religion in my religion, re my religion is true love. And it's a relationship with two fallible gods who co-worship each other and then dedicate that worship and love to the mystery of the universe, whatever name you want to call it. And the more you love yourself and your partner, the more religious you are in any religion, as far as I'm concerned. I, you know, bring any religious scholar. And, and the, the last thing I want to say, just because it didn't come up today, is in your sexual connections with your partner, I want, this is one thing people don't realize, you are responsible for your turn on. Your partner is not responsible for you feeling sexy, you feeling aroused. It's a gift, just like they can make you breakfast as a gift, but it's not their responsibility to get you to be in the mood. Your job is to research what gets you in the mood and to build a life and a structure that nourishes that. And it's not, oh, well, I'm only feeling sexy when you say or do that. You can ask them to say or do that, but you need to learn to generate your turn on from your aliveness. I can get turned down turned on by a lily, by a sunset. You can harness and alchemize bits of reality into a sexual turn on because all excitement feeds sexual pleasure. And I, it's, you know, that's something we can pick up another time, but your right. turn on is your responsibility. And so is your orgasm, by the way. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful conversation. People are so thrilled by this. I hope to have you back on the podcast sometime soon. And thank you for joining us on Mind Valley.